welcome back to Newspeak Live. I'm Terry Shankman, and welcoming you to the Terry Berry Biddy Show. My name is Kerry Shankman. I'm a First Amendment and human rights lawyer from the United States. I, I work with an uh, influential constitutional lawyer named Michael Ratner, who's the former president of the Center for Constitutional Rights. And they're behind a lot of Guantanamo Bay cases, as well as the current uh, large case against the New York Police Department and the stop and frisk case. Um, and together with him, we, uh, we represent journalists and whistleblowers who are persecuted and censored for their work. And I'm very happy to be here today with you, Vinny, um, to talk a little bit about some of the things that I do um, and also uh, issues that might be facing journalists yeah. um, in this conference. Um, thank you very much for being here, Kerry. Um, this uh, talk is about fighting for new laws, and the basis on which we are fighting for new laws is the human rights. Now, if you could give us a brief definition of what you think human rights are and if there is a comparison to be made between human um, human. Uh, laws that are to be made in the virtual world and in the non-virtual world, and how how the two rights can conflict or perhaps go go together. Definitely. So when we talk about human rights, that can that can be kind of an intimidating term because um, it, it it can seem so broad and so removed. Like, what does it mean if a police officer stops me and I, I talk about my human rights? Like, mm. Can I can I walk into a police station? Can I walk into a court and say human rights? And what like what's the mechanism for actually enforcing that? Um, when, when we talk about human rights, we're really talking about fundamental rights that we acknowledge that all people have, regardless of their class, regardless of, of their nationality, ethnicity, mm -hmm. regardless of any characteristics that are fundamental to being a human. Um, and, and it's very important to, to think about these because of uh, the fact that states and state sovereigns don't always defend rights, even if they have national constitutions and bil bills of rights. Um, so sometimes it's necessary to go to a broader international level. Um, and we see that, so, uh, so that's the reason we have the United Nations. That's the reason we have the Geneva Convention and the laws of war. Sometimes it's just not enough for a state alone to guarantee an individual's rights. Um, but the, the second question then is, all right, so we have these rights. What does it mean? Is it, is it just something that be reiterated on paper, is, is it actually useful or is it just a waste of our time if we're, mm -hmm. we're talking about those, those rights? Um, so do you think there can be a sort of uniform platform for all countries to share, whether in the virtual world or the non-virtual world, in terms, of, in terms of rights, seeing as there's huge uh, inequality mm -hmm. uh, between uh, most countries in the world and how, how can, for, for instance, some people access to privacy? How can everyone access to privacy if there is this huge disparity and most of the life on the planet is becoming expendable and you know can just be sort of cast away because machines are taking over the role mm -hmm. of uh, workers and all that? How can we all have access to privacy? How is that oh. a possible feature? Definitely. It, well, it's, it's really critical today also because the way we think about rights is much different than we would have 50 years ago because we have this thing, the internet, and we have, it, it's not just uh, interaction between people and states anymore. We also interact with each other across boundaries, and we interact with multinational corporations that span um, that span multiple states. And many times, you can have corporations that grow so big that that they almost have, or even you know, uh, grow more powerful than states. Mm. Uh, so the question becomes then: How do we renegotiate that social contract? How how do you actually um, how do you give any meaning to rights? And it, it, it's difficult. I I feel we're in a very transformative stage right now. Um, in, in terms yeah, of human true. rights, it's it's not just our rights vis a vis states, but also um, companies and private actors. Like, you know, I'm actually as a, as a lawyer more concerned about people's rights with respect to Google and Facebook and all the companies that are uh, sharing information with each other than necessarily um, states. I think that's really where we're headed um, in the future. So it's it, it's unclear. Um, the U the UN is doing quite a bit of work regarding the obligations of, of corporations, but it, it, it becomes a much tougher issue uh, because you don't, have, um, you don't have a clear definition internationally um, and any really clear conventions on what those parameters are. Yeah, yeah. Um, is, is the legal system enough, perhaps, to enforce uh, these human rights, or do we have to sort of rethink a new ethical stance uh, that can be shared by the entire planet, perhaps, since, since you know, companies like the NSA, Five Eyes, or should we say 35 Eyes, you know, have just like branched out all over the world and it's just a massive umbrella under which so many other, you know, countries are working for, 
um, should there be a new general ethical stance on which everyone can, can agree on? Or is the legal system enough of a platform to, to promote that? Yeah, it, it, it's difficult to say as a lawyer that we need more than the law because there's, there's a, uh, there are a lot of lawyers who would just be very happy to only use the legal system. Mm -hmm. But I think we're, we're at this critical time where we can't just rely on one thing. We have to rely on activism. We have to rely on politics. We have to rely on the work of journalists because um, the law is just one of many tools. Um, and the law, many times, um, it, it moves very slowly. Mm. So the, you know, the law doesn't really lead. The law kind of lags behind and tends to be very conservative, mm. um, which, which can be difficult because sometimes it can actually be an instrument to, to solidify the status quo um, rather than to, um, to create something truly progressive. So in terms of, of the role of the law, um, Again, it's unclear, but I think, I think there's a lot of push, at least on the international level, to try to better define the human rights obligations of states and companies. And I think that's, that's the very first step, is to try to create consensus. Um, and with that, once you have consensus, then you can start to create accountability, because then you create a norm um, by which you can hold actors, uh, whether they be public or private, yeah. um, you yeah. have a norm to hold people uh, accountable. That's good. You need to get that norm going. Yeah. Um, Media in this country can now access files which are used in, in court proceedings. Um, and some people think it's a bad thing, some people think uh, it's a really good thing. First of all, what do you think of that? And secondly, uh, leading on from that argument that the media can use uh, documents that will be used in court, um, that will sort of push the general population to have a bigger knowledge of what's going on, first of all, and maybe perhaps in the future have more of an involvement. What, what do you think uh, the, the, the general population, including journalists and people mm -hmm. like myself, have to do with the law? What sort of involvement should we have? What sort of say sure. should we have in, in, in matters like that, even though we're not specialists like yourself? Sure. Well, I can't speak too much to the uh, situation in the UK because I'm not licensed and uh, I don't right. work here. But yeah. um, in, in the United States, at least, um, there's actually a, a very strong presumption of, of access to court documents. Um, and I think that's actually very important. Um, because traditionally the judicial branch is, is designed to be a check uh, on your legislature and your executive. Um, and in order to be a meaningful check, um, it has to be open um, for public scrutiny. And actually in the United States we have several ways in which, uh, in which the public right to access court documents is protected. So you have under our First Amendment, um, which is our free speech uh, clause, there's um, a right of access to court documents. And there's also a right under the common law. And basically what that means is that, um, is, is that our, our law has established that there, there's a public interest in having scrutiny uh, of court proceedings because otherwise when you have secrecy, you begin to lose that accountability. Yeah, yeah. Um, and for instance, it's especially important in say criminal trials. Um, when we have a criminal trial or a trial by jury, um, that's essentially a trial by the public. And it, it's, it's not the, really the state, it's not the government, it's mm -hmm. the public that's deciding to condemn someone um, for committing a crime. And, and that's not possible to do if, if those members, and not just those members, but the public, don't have the ability to access documents. Um, the media is absolutely critical to that, because how can the public today know what's going on without the media having access? Um, yeah. This is actually a huge, huge is uh, issue in the court martial of whistleblower Chelsea Manning. Yeah. Um, so she was uh, trialed under the es uh, tried under the Espionage Act um, in uh, in Fort Meade, Maryland, and uh, it, it, significantly it was a, a military proceeding. So um, the prosecutors tried to argue that the whole thing had to be kept under seal, basically that the public didn't have a right to access any transcripts, any um, any physical copies of judgments, uh, briefs from the parties any documents. And actually, I was involved um, back then um, with the Center for Constitutional Rights in a lawsuit um, on behalf of journalists like Glenn Greenwald um, to try to get public access to those documents um, because it was um, probably one of the most important trials of, of, of the last century in the United States for its implications for whistleblowers and for journalists. And here, a military court was saying that despite that, the public can't even see transcripts. Mm, you had to have yeah. Alexa O'Brien, uh, a journalist who was physically writing down 
copies of everything everything said in the courtroom and posting them on our website. I mean, it, it's really remarkable that, and so that, I think that shows kind of the importance of having access. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, what was um, the Espionage Act, Act initially drafted for? Oh gosh, wow. um, so the the Espionage Act it, it has a really really rich history in the state. It, disappointing, but rich history. So it was uh, passed in 1917. Um, so really, really in the wake of, of World War I. Mm -hmm. And it was initially passed uh, to suppress um, supporters of Germany mm -hmm. and, uh, and socialists. And it was actually used, uh, used very much to, uh, to suppress um, people who opposed the war. So anybody who spoke out against the draft, um, not just people who directly supported Germany, but there are actually Supreme Court cases involving people who just made, made a statement um, or publish a leaflet, uh, um, you know, condemning uh, going to war, uh, and this was very pro problematic then because mm -hmm. we still have, uh, and it's still problematic now because we have this law sitting around. That, why, why is it still here? So um, I, I, I should take a step back and actually explain what what the law actually is. So it's um, it, it it's basically a secrecy law. It, it punishes uh, dissemination of um, of uh, national what's called national defense. Information um, and essentially is a secrecy a secrecy law which um, punishes including um, revealing classified information. But it's been interpreted um, over the last century in ways that push closer and closer to it being used against um, a, a, against journalists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right now, there's a, actually an ongoing investigation against WikiLeaks that's been ongoing for over four years um, that uh, we suspect is under the Espionage Act. Um, there have been attempts to use the law against the New York Times and the Chicago Tribune in the past. Um, it, it, it was a law that was used to convict Chelsea Manning of 35 years in prison. It um, was also used against various whistleblowers and actually under uh, President Obama's administration uh, what has been used ag against more whistleblowers than under all presidents yeah. combined, yeah. which is, is very significant. I mean, mm -hmm. you have a president in office right now who's um, you know, former constitutional law professor mm. that's using a secrecy law to punish whistleblowers. And it's, it's really, really remarkable. Yeah, absolutely ridiculous. Um, this, this here talk is entitled Fighting for New Laws. Yeah. Um, what laws should we be fighting for concretely? What, what should we all be activizing mm. for? Yeah, it, it's a really important question because, I mean, we can, we can talk about the philosophy of human rights and, and all these topics, but I'm, I'm glad you uh, mentioned that because we can't really... We can't really move forward if the law isn't on our side. Mm. And um, a, a point I made on a panel earlier is that when we when you talk about laws too, we have to not only think about the laws that uh, we as activists want to pass, but mm. also ones that the other side wants to push for, because um, that's certainly happening. And after after the Snowden disclosures, there's been a huge, huge push by um, by security and surveillance agencies, um, by you know. Uh, by by the, basically the you know the war hawks and everyone backlash and yeah to try to um try to sh shape public opinion that we need laws to defend our security that that you know there are all these threats um, that for for the matter are way overblown and uh, and most of the time completely unsubstantiated so I think it's critical that we think of what the other side is doing but as as far as specifically new laws um, well there's several things we can do um, first we can push for protection laws for sources of journalists. Right, yeah. And one way we can do that is by trying to implement what are called shield laws. So there's some debate in the United States right now about this, but a shield law is, is basically a law that um, creates what's called a privilege for a journalist. Um, a privilege is kind of like um, what you have between uh, a doctor and a patient or, uh, you know, or between two spouses, which uh, basically says that any communications between them are protected. A court can't, can't say, you know, or the police can't go to the court and say, okay, you have to reveal that communication because it's protected under law. Um, so the argument is that a privilege should apply to journalists and their sources, that um, a journalist can't be dragged in the court and told, you have to say the name of your confidential source. Um, the implications of this are, are, are critical because... Um, because otherwise, sources would be afraid to come forward. If they felt that there was a risk that a journalist they talked to was 
going to yeah. get dragged Absolutely. in the court. Even if the journalist was their best friend, even if the journalist was willing you know, to do anything for them, if they were compelled, um, facing imprisonment and punishment, to tell their source, I mean, that's, that's a different matter. Um, but then there's, there's kind of a, there's a difficult question that follows, is who that privilege should apply to. Um, and at least in, in my view, the definition of journalist should be very, very, very broad. Um, but there's some people that don't think so. Um, there, there are actually quite, quite a few um, folks in the US and the UK combined who think that journalists are only people who completed an education at Columbia Journalism School, who work at a major institutional news outlet, who are salaried, for instance, or who regularly report stories. Um, but as we know, it's a lot more complicated today. And journalists aren't just institutional reporters, and they haven't been for a number of decades now. We have bloggers who are breaking uh, tremendous stories. We have individuals on Twitter who have greater followings, um, you know, who are just uh, reporting uh, students and activists. So do you think that's, that's perhaps the, the future? Absolutely. Of it being, you know, accessible yeah. to everyone to be not, not a journalist per se. Absolutely. But, you know, people to have their blogs, their own Twitter accounts, in which they, they unravel loads of, loads of stories. Um, what can you tell us maybe more specifically about, um, after the Snowden revelation, what the government's been doing um, sort of more specifically to sort of calm all of this hysteria down, implementing new laws on their side? Yeah, um, and just quickly a point on, on the future. I, I would actually go so far to say is, um, is that, that it's not the future of journalism, it's the present and, and even really the past. And I think the attempts to constrict the definition of a journalist are, are, are really trying to distort what is a reality. Hmm. Um, and I think that's a really important point to make clear that any attempts to, to only give privileges to journalists who um, work for outlets is, is really trying to distort reality, um, although it's still something that uh, many outlets are, are pushing for. But um, on, on the next point as to measures that have developed, um, well, the uh, NSA uh, General Keith Alexander, um, or former, he, he stepped down now, actually back in, I believe, April or around April, um, had a, I, I believe he was interviewed by The Guardian. Um, mm. I, I, you need to double check where the story appeared, but um, where it's not as important, but he, he suggested that he was going to push for what's called media leaks legislation. Um, and there's actually been a, a growing push from intelligence agencies to, to what's called plug leaks to deal with this problem of the release of classified information. So we've seen um, in a few different layers. There have been increased um, regulations within, um, within like the US government, I believe other governments, to try to limit, um, to, to limit what, um, what government employees can say to the media. And what's actually kind of ironic is that the government in those, in those regulations has very broad defi definitions of media. They say, oh yeah, the media is basically anyone, so you really can't talk to anybody. But it's hypocritical because in other cases they say, oh, the media is only, you know, my friend at the New York Times or mm -hmm. something, but mm -hmm. it's a footnote. Um, but I mean, they're really attempts to, um, to, to really restrict government employees to make it harder for whistleblowers by tracking them, by increasing the penalties. Yeah. Um, the use of the Espionage Act actually is, is, is one such um, po policy, like the, the use of um, two charges of the Espionage Act against Edward Snowden. Um, it's, it's not just designed to be a punishment, it's designed to be a deterrent. Right. Because the, yeah. uh, you know, the, uh, the criminal complaint um, that, uh, that was uh, filed in Virginia, um, you know, it, it, was a, it was a sealed document. It, it was leaked by the government, and there is a reason it, it was likely leaked. It was leaked to send the message that, you know, if, if you are a whistleblower and if you're even thinking about doing this, the boot is going to come down on you. Yeah. I mean, it, it is very deliberate. So I think there, we see a kind of efforts on many fronts, and then, of course, right. there's the pressure on other countries. So I think there, there are a lot of signs of, of movement. Scary. It, it, it is scary. frightening. Um, earlier in your talk, uh, you were talking about something I'd like to touch upon very clearly. Could you tell me what verily, narrowly crafted defenses could you think of right now uh, through which publishers uh, would not have immunity? Oh, that's, that, that's a very tough question. Um, because it, it, it's one actually, as a lawyer, I, I struggle with a lot. Um, mm. I was actually... Um, are, I was, are there instances where they might not have immunity? Well, I think... Um, if you look at least like, if you look internationally and like in the United States, 
from basically every like legal instrument, um, and I, I believe this is the case in, in most countries, but um, but uh, nearly every instrument has some provision that if there's really a credible threat right. of imminent harm, mm. um, you know, if if we're talking about like nuclear launch codes, or um, in the in the U.S. there's a there's a big case involving like you know. Uh, uh, at least this is the law in, in the U.S. The publication of like you know where where troops are, etc. Um, then like there's an argument for for not publishing that information. But there are all, are also ways to deal with that um, that are you know far below what the government is doing right now. So um, you know I, I don't think we're anywhere near that point. I don't think we're anywhere near the type of harm of imminence. I think mm -hmm. the conversations we're having around the world about the, the harm done by publication are far outblown. They're completely unsubstantiated. Um, the best proof of this actually was during the Chelsea Manning trial. Um, part of the government's argument in the pretrial proceedings was that uh, the disclosures of, of, uh, of um, Chelsea Manning caused, uh, caused harm. And there were actually representatives of different government agencies that were brought in to testify. Um, that these disclosures ca caused harm, um, and they weren't able to they weren't able to present any evidence. Mm. And this is when it was yeah. in the government's interest to make that claim. Mm. And time and time again, we've seen you know that this is simply rhetoric. It's simply fear mongering. I mean, going mm. back to the eighties, I, I actually was doing research just a few few weeks ago. Um, there have been like uh, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act Act was passed in the United States in in the eighties after the um, the one Matthew Broderick movie where, um, with the, uh, gosh, it, War Games, yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, it was actually passed as a res like, response to that movie because these Congress people who were completely clueless and knew nothing about technology fe yeah. like feared this is a legitimate outcome. So they passed this draconian, dracon a draconian law that applies the language of physical trespass to computers. Um, and they were saying back then, they were saying in the 80s, they were saying in the 90s, they were saying, um, you know, for the last 10 years, we're on the verge of digital destruction. We're going to have, like, basically the Waterloo of, you yeah. know, we're going to have uh, hackers breaking into systems and, and taking over the whole U.S. and turning all traffic lights purple or something. I mean, we've been hearing that for decades, and it's never happened. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah. And when will people learn that, like, you know, yeah. the wolf has cried, like, 50 times and it hasn't happened. Yeah. Like, there's really, there, there's something, there's politics behind this. Yeah, and until yeah. there's physical proof. Mm, I'm glad you talked about uh, fear mongering and um, to what extent is that induced in, into the population, in your opinion? And when we talk about you know terrorism and all of this uh, surveillance and all of these new um, laws that are meant to sort of you know scare whistleblowers and the media and all of that, um, is that genuine paranoia? Do you think is that genuine paranoia, or is that just a very very effective tool to sort of subdue um, people? It's it's a ladder. It's a tool for control. I mean, that's the first step is con uh, to control is fear. Yeah. And I mean, this is, I mean, it's been a part of Western civilization for, you know, mm. long. So should we be surprised that it's going on nowadays? I don't think we should be surprised. I mean, the form, the, the only thing different is, is the form and the, the circumstances. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the, the tool itself is unchanged. Mm -hmm. I, I just think that our, our political and legal structures aren't well enough equipped to handle and adapt to it. Right. Um, and the problem is that is that many of our power structures are, are they're archaic, really. I mean, mm. even in the States, I mean, like, our system of checks and balances. So how would you have it adapt, though? If it's yeah. so archaic and the foundations are so profound and old, how would you, how would you make it go forward? I mean, that's, uh, that, that's where activism comes in. I, th I think you really have to have meaningful, meaningful change at a structural level, and that's really the only way to fix it. I mean, um, mm. when you have, a, you know, no meaningful checks and balances when you have um, basically no limits on intelligence agencies. You can try to pass laws. I mean, that you can try to try to have the beast restrain itself, but but really you need to you need to create a structure that mm. that doesn't allow that to happen. Yeah. Um, and there are many different ideas. I, I think activism is is really a key part. The public has to be involved because yeah. Um, this is a recurring question we've had over the last uh, few days. How is any accountability possible um, within within government and all of that? Everyone's bouncing off each other. 
Yeah, well, the first step, the first step to accountability is actual transparency. I mean, that, that, that's just the baseline. I mean, there, there can't be accountability if, if things aren't in the public light. So that, that's where the work of journalists is absolutely critical. Um, public access to information is critical. Um, the public can't be apathetic. I mean, the, pu the public has, has to care. Because the public doesn't care, then, mm. I mean, if, if nobody's looking at you. And you think briefly you know, that's also part of the whole thing, is that making sure we don't really care? Yeah. Yeah, there, there are many attempts to distract, and I, I think the, the, fear, the fear is one big part. Um, thank you. Um, we have a few Twitter questions that are going to appear on this week's okay. television. Um, so there's the first one. Could you elaborate on what you said about students being monitored with some specific cases? What did I say about students being monitored with some specific Oh, wait. In what context? I don't know. I don't yeah. even know who posted this question. It seems to be an anonymous yeah. source. Well, I, I'm trying to recall what I said, what I said about students. Um, uh, probably earlier about journalists. Perhaps someone from the audience can help. Uh, you know, they, or, they or we can watch. maybe go to the next question and I'll, I'll try to th try to think about it. But right, yeah. Um, um, oh no, you did say that in general students uh, were being watched. And could you provide any specific cases, perhaps that you've been? Well, actually, I, I can actually talk about uh, a little bit about the Occupy movement. Um, Particularly, that, that, that was something I was involved in um, in, in New York City, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it was largely a, a student movement. It was a movement of young people. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really relevant for so many uh, of our viewers right now is that so uh, our, our global movements right now, I mean, they're, they're movements by the young. Mm -hmm. And that's what's creating change. If you look at Hong Kong right now, if you look at, you know, if you look at movements like o Occupying the Arab Spring, they're movements of, of young people. And... So in, in Occupy, actually, there are countless cases uh, uh, of students being, being monitored. Um, you had police officers in New York infiltrating the protests, going undercover, um, posing as, as uh, organizers. You had uh, cases of um, people being followed, uh, of um, being watched, of, um, of the press being blocked from filming. Um, so I, I, I think like that, that's actually one, one huge case. Um, there's also uh, another case in New York I can speak to, which is the case of Muslim surveillance, surveillance of Muslim students. There's actually evidence of, of police going into mosques and also Muslim student groups at, at, at schools um, mm. to, uh, to spy on people and for their religious beliefs. I mean, this is something so fundamental. Yeah. And it, I, it's just such a, such, a, such a violation, I think, uh, of something so... So core to us, so sacred. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. I agree. And uh, we have another Twitter question. Um, you've talked a lot about what is wrong in the US and UK. Is there an example of a country that is doing it right, perhaps Northern Europe? <laughs> I, um, yeah, so I, I, I mostly focus on, I, on the US um, because it, I, I can speak kind of the most candidly about it. Um, like I said, I don't, I, I don't practice in the UK. I'm not really qualified to comment on the UK. Um, but uh, I actually, a huge part of my, my research as a human rights advocate is, is looking across jurisdictions. So one thing I'm trying to do, and what I spoke about in my last panel, is look at how secrecy laws are evolving around the world. Mm. Um, so I actually look a lot at, at Asian countries. I, I, I look at, um, at what's happening in journalists worldwide. And I think, um, I mean, it, it's, it's really difficult. It's really difficult to come up with examples of, of doing it right. There, there's some countries that are, that are better than others. Mm, what's the standard? Um, so I, I think, well, I think like Canada, and, and Canada is one country that tends, tends to be better than some others, but there are also some, some flaws in um, what's called their soya. It's, a, uh, it's a, a secrecy law that they have there. And I yeah. spoke about it briefly at the last yeah. panel, but. So there's some countries that allow for more defenses under their laws and more opportunities. Um, Denmark, uh, I believe, uh, acquitted um, some journalists who had published um, information regarding, uh, regarding Iraq, but Denmark's also kind of inconsistently uh, applied its laws. Um, and uh, this is kind of a subject of ongoing research, but I think, I, I think they're definitely like, we, it's important not to harp up the countries that are that we think are doing well because we also don't want to justify. Right, whatever they've been doing. Yeah, doing exactly. As well. I see. Yeah, I don't think anyone's exempt from uh, right. wrongdoing here and there. Well, that's uh, that's very interesting. Could you perhaps 
Oh, apparently there's one more to the questions, okay. which is about to appear. Uh, where does free speech and, and abuse begin, especially with so many stories in the media about trolling? Yeah, so that's, um, so we talked a little bit about, um, you, you asked me about what are the limits of free speech, and, and I mean, this is one of the hardest issues for free speech lawyers, because you have folks on both sides. Um, so there's, there's, some, there's some cases, like you have hard issues, like very tough issues regarding defamation, regarding issues like revenge porn, regarding hate speech. Um, and and these, these issues become very tricky, and they're trickier online because in, in many ways, people often feel freer to, to mm. speak online. Like, mm. you just look at YouTube comments and you can see like humanity devolves in front of your eyes. But I think, you know, so it's, it's really impossible and it'd be a waste of time to try to draw a clear line. I think the, the well, where we have to rest are our principles. I, I think the hard cases have to be resolved case by case. That's that's where the law right. really really begins. I I, I I would say that like harm harm needs to be identifiable. So if we're talking about trolling, like I mean, people have a right to troll. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, <laughs> and maybe um, we can enshrine that in a international mechanism, the right to troll. <laughs> but I don't think we're probably not gonna gonna get that soon. But I yeah. think. I think part of the right to, to speak is the right to dissent, is the right to disagree, yeah. is, and is the right to be like uh, the right to be a dick about it. Yeah. I mean, that's that's what our society is based on. Like, you can't have, um, as uh, as Burnt Fix so eloquently said in his talk uh, the other day, you can't have, you know, you can't have genius without you know some uh, yeah. the annoying yeah. aspects of society. So yeah, yeah. absolutely, where would you draw the line between uh, one's privacy and one's rights. Wow. Draw, draw a how, line between... How would you draw that line? Well, well, privacy is a right, so I'm not, I'm not sure I... Right. Right, well, perhaps... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I so I, I would, I would say that they're in a very, very happy, long-lasting marriage. I understand. <laughs> um, well, that's really good. Could you perhaps tell us very briefly about um, US involvement? In, in Europe, in these countries like like Denmark, perhaps or Sweden more specifically, mm -hmm. what's been going on there with the, perhaps with the, with the police force in Sweden and U.S. involvement, and um, yeah, I mean, I don't want to get too much into like foreign policy in, Sc in Scandinavian countries just because I don't have it on hand, and that's a, that's the sort of thing that I, I mean, I, I could start talking about it, but it'd probably be a waste of your time because I, I have notes written on this, but it's, right. I don't spend as much time with it. So. Right. Fair enough. Um, we're going to open up to the floor. If anyone has any questions to ask Karen, uh, now's the time to fire away. Um, we've got a gentleman at the back and another gentleman at the front, and one in the middle. I mean, the laws, the laws that could be created that would that would help um, improve human rights and justice worldwide. What is the point of creating new new laws when we're talking about how archaic and pointless the system is? So. I think um, well, that's a really important point. Um, I think there, there's really two stages, um, and I should ar articulate that more clearly. Um, there's really two steps. So the first is the first goal is that we want to we want to change the system itself. But assuming that that can't be done, or that you know, in the process of making you know uh, accomplishing that, we need to think about basically what's our plan B. So so first we want to change the system, but to the extent that we live within an imperfect system. You know, do we do we just sit there and accept it, or are there ways that we can at least leverage within that? So I, I absolutely agree that I think there there is some sense of maybe just I, I it, it not so much futility, but really kind of slowing, slowing a it, it kind of we're lifting ourselves out of a negative rather than necessarily creating positives when we try to um, work within new laws. But at least I think we're making the system. Um, less worse, more slowly, um, and I, I, I think that's important because we, we really are um, we really are on a slippery slope, um, and the only way we're going to go in the other direction is if we slow the downward momentum. I wish I could say something a little more optimistic. But <laughs> So in some cases, 
although there are so many motivated people here, and mm -hmm. um, recently again I met someone from the say ICT world, mm -hmm. so basically they're still <laughs> investigating uh, Yugoslavian war crimes. It's still happening, right? So uh, on the one hand, yes, I, I do agree with your efforts, and it, it is necessary. But if it's taking so long, like uh, of course you advocate for activism and all these things, but what would be uh, like what what is the g uh, general template that we must adopt immediately, or is there a, a mechanism for that that we we can say okay this is definitely not acceptable, but we don't have the legal precedent for it. Absolutely. Well, I I actually worked at the ICTY and published a piece on the ICC, so maybe uh, maybe I'll talk to you afterwards and see who some of your friends are. Um, I actually, it, it's interesting, because I, I am pretty skeptical of, um, it's interesting you cite those two courts, because um, they're, they're uh, international criminal courts in, in The Hague, and they uh, try crimes under international criminal law. Um, I'm, I actually, you know, since, since being there, I've grown skeptical, um, mostly because they're often used as, as tools of the West, funded by the West, um, you know, the ICC um, is predominantly, uh, so far, I don't believe has any cases out outside of Africa and has a couple investigations that haven't moved in other places like Colombia, et cetera. Um, but I, I, I think, so I, I wouldn't look to those international criminal bodies as any solution, and I, I would agree. I, I don't think we're going to get anywhere with them, um, maybe in the future, but, but not now. Um, but I, I do think there are other international bodies. Um, there's, there's groups within the uh, United Nations that are very, very progressive. Um, groups like, uh, you know, like the uh, Working Group on Ar Arbitrary Detention, the Universal uh, Periodic Review, the um, Human Rights uh, Committee. Um, and, uh, and there's also other courts, like the European Court of Human Rights, um, that have binding authority o over Europe. Now, those cases in the European Court can take a very long time, but we have actually seen some some good victories. So, within human rights, it's it's slow moving, but there are some mechanisms there. Um, as to the other question about kind of what the next immediate steps are with, besides activism, I think I think there's a a great need to, um, and that's the reason I, I do my work. There's a great need to protect journalists. Um, because the first step is, is is really information, is openness, is, is access to information. So that means making sure journalists can have relationships with sources. That means making sure journalists can punish without fear, or sorry, journalists can publish without fear of being punished. Um, <laughs> and it, it also means having robust access to information um, without uh, tons of exceptions for uh, for classified information and, uh, and national security. Um, be before we can do anything, we need, to, we need to understand fully what we're up against, and we cannot understand what we're up against if we don't actually have open information. I believe there's one more question in the audience. Well, uh, John Lowe, I'm, I'm not a lawyer. I prefer to see the legal code um, so I prefer to see the legal code as an operating system. Um, and uh, introducing new laws to this kind of operating system is like what we in IT lingo call patching. And every good software developer knows there's a certain point in time when patching does not make sense anymore. You have right. to basically switch operating system or, or switch, to, uh, switch to new code. Uh, so how do we detect that in, in, uh, in the legal context? Can we reach a free society with an operating so, uh, with a legal code more operating like 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 Windows instead of new Linux? I, I think our I think our legal code needs to operate like Linux. <laughs> it, yeah, it doesn't absolutely. Um, but I think actually I, I greatly appreciate that point um, because I, I I think many of the principle actually that analogy goes many steps further because. Um, we want we want our systems to be open. I mean that's one of the big goals, and you know we, we find that the systems that work better in the operating system context are are open, are, are free systems, and and I, I think there's a, a great analogy um, to our situation right now. So yeah, that that goes to the point that I was saying. I th I think we're at the point where where structural change is very necessary because the the way there there are huge asymmetries in checks and balances today that were just impossible to foresee um, 
when you know many of our, our structures were developed. Um, you know, you have executive agencies that have just spiraled out of control. You have multinational corporations that have no meaningful checks on them, and in many cases are are stronger than than states. And I think um, I, I absolutely agree that we're at a point where um, where where patching isn't going to do it. I think at the moment um, it's it's we still have to do it just to you know just to keep keep the operating system even functioning, if if you will. But I absolutely agree, and I, I think activism and openness are the are the way to get there. Or is it is it a disruptive act to to switch uh, to switch off the operating system of the society? Well, I, th I, mean, I think history shows that it's, it's, it is disruptive. Um, I mean, absolutely. I think it, it, it's difficult to, to have dramatic change, change without the dramatic par part of it. And what that means today, I, I mean, I don't think it necessarily has to be in, you know, the, in, the, um, in, in the historical sense of, of revolution. I mean, it, it may be a revolution of sorts, but it may be a, a digital revolution. It may, it may be broader than something confined to states. It, and I think we are seeing a global movement develop. And I, I, I think it, it, it is going to be dramatic. Thank you very much for the questions. Um, this was the Carrie Vinny Vinny show, although the monkey isn't here. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. This is Thank you, Vinny. This the Logan Symposium. This was Fighting for New Laws. I'm Vincent Dilowski. And back to the main thing.